So I'm Walt McCree. I, I'm a, the chair of the Public Banking Institute, which is a, a national nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, group, citizens uh, uh, alliance um, initiative uh, to create new public banks, public interest banks around the U.S. Uh, there are uh, banks, public banks all over the world, but in the United States we only have one. So let me get a sense from you guys who who has heard about public bank or knows what a public So I won't I'd spend a little bit of, of time about that, um, but I would like to uh, start at the beginning a little bit about money, but also kind of put the whole conversation into the context of where we are as citizens and why public banks are such a great idea now and why there is some urgency, uh, I would say a good bit of urgency, about why public, public banks are needed. So I want to say a couple of things about the public banks, what they are not, they are not uh, public public bank is in the model of the North Dakota Bank. Uh, that's a state-owned public bank in which all of the deposits, all the tax revenues, all of the fees and parking tech, you know, the fees and the penalties, all go in by law, goes into their bank. And they, and they use that bank as the depository for all the state's receipts. Uh, and it is, uh, it is the state of North Dakota doing business as a bank. So, uh, now this, the state model is one thing, but state banks, but public banks could also be created on the city level, or the county level, or created in a regional sort of a way as well. And the idea, simply, is to keep your money at home and invest in yourself. And, the idea, and so it, it, it starts to uh, re-support the notion that a local economy has its own integrity, and its own wealth, and its own objectives, and instead of sending your money off to Wall Street and let them speculate and deny, let them, you know, let, let, let the equity, the assets of your community be used to finance the needs and the desires of the community. So a public bank is not, as, as we envision in any way, it's the North Dakota model, but I think uh, this is a, it's a, it's a very successful one because that's 96 years old. Uh, is not a commercial bank. That is to say, it doesn't make you, won't make you, uh, more, it won't give you a mortgage, it won't give you car loan, they don't have ATMs, they don't have branches. They essentially, in our model especially, they do not compete with local financial institutions like community banks, credit unions, savings and loans. Where the competition that we envision and that uh, is if we were, if we were the strongest prospect and the most desirable prospect is that the creation of public banks will push back against the global banking interests which we collectively call Wall Street, Wall Street banks, which have really been running roughshod over our society and our economy uh, for a long, 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 long time. Uh, as you know, money and power are pretty much synonymous. The politics uh, derives from the money influence and, and the money connections. Uh, so there is a, there's a point to this that has to do with democracy and our governance that's very important to consider. Because when you look at America, you realize that we don't have a democracy here. This is an oligarchy. Princeton, pretty much, uh, and Northwestern, I think, had that wonderful study about two years ago and said, what, you know? <laughs> yeah. well, the last 40 years, you look at the will of the people and you see how much that gets reflected in public policy. And I like they said, there's no statistically significant indication that anything that y'all want shows up in the law. So, uh, and that's certainly, that, that's the, the icing on the cake, or at least the, the, the surface appearance. Uh, so, we have a problem. We have a real banking problem. We have a, we have a problem with uh, governance being tied to money and the consolidation of money and the continual stream of, of uh, capital development and, and profiteering becoming in the hands of fewer and fewer people, which of course undermines the great wealth of America, which uh, and the, the middle class and the, the diversity of our economic system. We've all been pretty much reduced down to a level of debt, serve, debt slave. You know, that used to be that uh, in the feudal days, you know, you, you worked for the nobles and the elite and so forth. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, there was slavery itself, where you worked, uh, where you were placed. Now, uh, it was interesting, Rothschild, uh, 
Nathan Rothschild said back during the Civil War, he said, you know, we're not, we're against slavery because, you know, we, do, uh, we just don't really, why have it? And the problem with slavery is that you have to look after the slaves. You gotta feed them, you gotta clothe them and stuff, you know? We would prefer to have wage labor, right? You know where that's going, right? By wages, then the oligarchs or the, uh, the uh, financial uh, private interests are able to control the economy, control the people, and keep them poor, and keep them struggling. Now, uh, that, and the net result is that the margin of profitability, all money coming from labor, all value, all, uh, not money, but all uh, wealth coming from labor, uh, redounds then to those who control the wealth systems in their hand. Uh, money, banking, is, uh, is an incredibly cool franchise. It is, the, it is the license to create money. It literally is the license to create money. People think that money is created, or many of us think that, that money is created by the Federal Reserve and that there's a set amount of it, as there used to be when there was a gold standard and other standards and so forth. Well, the gold standard was abandoned in the mid, mid 20th century. But money really is essentially uh, an element of trust. It's a unit of authority, of exchange, and, and it's a value that, that varies depending upon how, how we trade. So, uh, and bankers, as the Bank of England uh, said two years ago, admitted, look, you know, banks uh, do not lend out the money that they get from their clients. They don't have a stash of cash in the vault when you want to go get money for your house uh, here in Portland, I suppose that's a couple million dollars <laughs> or a lot of money. They don't, they don't go to the vault, they give you the money, obviously. They give you a piece of paper and that paper is, says it's worth $250,000 and, and uh, they'll put that kind of entry into their account book saying that, you know, we're now giving this person uh, this amount of money and that for the bank is an asset. That actually becomes, that's an asset because They'll give you the money, but they're going to charge you for it. It's a fee, interest, and so forth. But it's, and of course, it's a bank liability. They have to come up with that money to, to enable you to buy the place and so forth. So there, it is a double entry uh, accounting system. Uh, the net of it is zero, except that is to say, you know, you, you borrow this much, they give you this much, and the money's all paid down. Nothing is left. The money actually is destroyed uh, when the loan is paid off. Uh, and, but what's the residue? The residue is the interest that uh, they didn't create, but that you are obligated to, to come up with and pay. Now, that is kind of at the cusp of the problem about our money system, that, uh, that we have to pay interest on every dollar that we borrow. Uh, and it's interesting because that is the franchise that makes banking so rich. Uh, compound interest is this extraordinary device, as you guys probably know, that you know, over a period of years, you, know, you can pay three, four percent on, or five percent on your mortgage, and then the price of your house suddenly doubles in a period of thirty or forty years. That's true for municipal borrowing too. So when we borrow money uh, to pay for infrastructure or pay for anything, uh, if we don't come up from it with our out of tax money and out of the money that we have uh, in the municipal level, uh, we have to go to Wall Street to borrow in bonds. Now this is, the, this is the point where I'd like to we'll focus a little bit later on in, in this discussion about um, what we can do to reclaim our democracy or at least to give ourselves a chance in what little time is left to get our hands on the levers of, uh, of our democratically based policy makers and, and governance uh, by holding on to our money and creating a device, a new device that allows us to actually build a mechanism for growing our wealth instead of continuing going to borrowing more money and going into more debt and having more taxes out of debt. Um, David talked about municipal finance, and I'll just say briefly about that, that if you were a, a treasurer, a city treasurer, county treasurer, whatever, your, your choices, your ability to fund things is really limited uh, in a couple of, uh, to very bad choices, essentially. If your budget will not sustain the need to repair a bridge, and most city budgets don't because they have to be balanced uh, at the end of the year, and they probably didn't budget for that particular bridge. Let's say it's a $50 million bridge. 
they don't have access to that in their budget, so what do they do? The, they could do, what can they, they have, they could go into more debt, which drives taxes up, or they could sell some things, which is a terrible idea, because, you know, if you sell off the public wealth, the public assets, especially to privatize it, that diminishes the overall equity and assets of the base. They can cut services to us all, you know, cut police, fire, all that stuff. They can fire people. Those are kind of the five principal options that, that the municipal financial managers have. So it's a cycle of debt, taxes, debt, taxes, debt, taxes. All of a sudden, the public banking prospect shows up on the horizon that reverses this 180 degrees. And that's what's so cool and exciting about it and why there are 50 initiatives around the country to create public banks. Many of them doing very well. We've come right over, they've been working on this for about five or six years, five years, six years, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and we are now seeing uh, developments in, in Santa Fe, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, uh, several places in, uh, in California, Arizona, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The list is quite, quite long. These initiatives being basically people in their towns who have gotten the, the word, seen the picture, uh, you know, seen what the thing is and say, look, uh, you know, let's stop paying, uh, let's stop paying our money to Wall Street, keep the money at home. So there's a campaign I'm going to tell you about at the, uh, at the end of this about that. But let's take a look locally at what this means. Uh, Portland uh, pays $48 million in interest alone every year on its debt. $48 million. I don't know what you guys are doing with $48 million, but I can imagine it could be useful somewhere. Perhaps enriching your school system or whatever. The list is endless, right? And there are a lot of things that you're not doing because you don't have it that $48 million, right? Uh, and that's just one year. And so you can multiply that times 10, it's a half a billion dollars, and, you know, 20 years, which goes by faster than we like, that's a billion dollars. And so cumulatively, you have this continual downward drain of efficiency, of, of, of diminishment of your common wealth. The state of Oregon uh, it spends about $348 million every year in interest and, fee, you know, and fees, just to borrow its money, just to manage its money. And believe me, that's on the low side. That's only the stuff that we see, because a lot of the lending, a lot of the management of the money is proprietary, trade secrets for these for these management funds and so forth. So this is just what the annual report uh, of, the, of the Portland and Oregon uh, are reporting, thanks to one of our friends, Diana DiRanzo, uh, who did that research here for us today, actually, just to, just to put it in context of, of what's getting sucked out of our uh, out of our community. So how does the public bank change that? Well, let's take an example that was in the news this morning. Uh, I was really delighted to see that you've got a group in your city council, uh, and I'm not sure that a committee of some sort having to do with socially responsible investing. And they said, look, Wells Fargo, which is where we have our money, uh, is uh, uh, we have $40 million sitting in Wells Fargo's corporate, kind of corporate bonds. Uh, and what they do is they invest in private incarceration systems. So they're propping up, in addition to the other uh, you know, very uh, unfortunate investment choices, um, they're investing in that. And we don't think that's right, and we don't want our money going there, so let's pull it out. Now, what they're going to do with it, I don't know. They have some choices. But if they had a public bank, let's, let's just imagine that you had a public bank. Let's take that $40 million, create a public bank, a, public, a, a Portland public bank. <clears throat> and uh, with that capital, the $40 million capital, what the banking law allows, and this is what's so cool about the franchise, is that you can, uh, based on having that $40 million, you can create $400 million in credit. $400 million in credit. You actually have to take that $40 million off the top of this reserve. Now, what? We don't have $40, $40 million. Where does it come from? Well, the, it, it depends on, on uh, it depends. It comes from the deposits and the flow uh, that comes through the coffers of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the municipality and the state. So what could happen if we had uh, 
that kind of money to, to redeploy and to reinvest? How could we invest? How could we start to save some money right away for public bank in Portland? Well, let's go back to that $50 million bridge. If you want to, uh, the city wants to build a bridge, they will go to, they will undoubtedly have to go to the bond market, which is Wall Street for something like that. That's where the action happens. Uh, but then the bond market includes, is, is driven by, uh, aside from the host of collaborative support of warm political uh, patronage of bodies, and no offense, that's uh, not offense at all, that's just the way, that's the way things work. You know, people work in league, that's fine. Um, and uh, so the bond crisis will, will take, will, will first of all position the bond, they'll assess the, the risk, they'll put it on the market, they'll underwrite it, and they'll uh, provide insurance for it, there will be attorney's fees, uh, and then and you'll be in the bond market, and not what your credit rating is, but it might be say three, four, five percent. Let's say four uh, percent. That's what I know Seattle's paying about three and a half percent. They just refinanced some of their bonds to pick up the margin because obviously over time, little bits of improvement in interest save you a lot of money. So the bond market, let's say, will give you four percent on that five hundred on that fifty million dollar loan, and over a period of 20, 25 years, it will increase the cost of the bridge about fifty percent on average. The price of infrastructure is, is uh, half of the cost that you pay. It turns out to be interest or, or, or financing. So in, in California, for example, the, the, the Bay Bridge was a $6 billion improvement for time materials and so forth. Uh, the financing was $6 billion. Uh, and, and, that, and that in itself then, for, for if, you have a, if your public bank says, well, uh, you know, since we're lending to ourselves, and since our purpose isn't to drive big paper profits, we don't have to maximize our profits here. What we want to do is build this bridge. And we'd like to save, so we want to save ourselves some money. We can do this. We've got enough, we've got $400 million of equity or of potential credit to distribute or to deploy or to invest. We can do this bridge and we'll do it at 1%. 3% margin right there, huge savings right there, plenty of huge savings. Uh, so, not only do you, can they save that amount of money, uh, the one percent, you're still paying interest though, you know, isn't, isn't that still the problem? Well, the one percent you're paying to yourself. So what happens is that you actually start to make money from your public bank by financing yourself through the equity and the assets that you have. So, so it's, it's simply stay-at-home investment uh, that, that is a, a, has a virtuous cycle of investment creating value, investment creating value. So it's counter <coughs> So instead of going further into debt, you're actually building wealth. Now in North Dakota, little, a little state of 700,000 people, uh, their bank, they have a $7.2 billion bank. Uh, it is the uh, envy of Wall Street, although I think Wall Street would like to ignore it. But uh, they are, their efficiency, their return on equity, which is a measure of the efficiency of a bank, is twice that of the best Wall Street bank. And now we would call Golden the best beginning, but that's, I think, the, the best performing bank. Uh, uh, bank of, uh, the Bank of North Dakota produces 17 to 25 percent religious year after year after year. Well, that's really unheard of in the industry, in part because the bank, the regular banks, uh, have branches and they have overhead and they have bonuses and so forth and so on that kind of drive their profitability down. The public bank doesn't have that because it's not operating that kind of business. It's not competing in the retail market. But still, uh, the margins are there for, uh, for us to be able to preserve and earn uh, an enormously exciting amount of potential uh, funds for, for what we want to create. Um, so, the prospect of creating this bank leads us to a new kind of day in, in, our, in our government and in our governance, and also in our uh, protection for ourselves, because the, as, as the consolidation of wealth gets smaller and smaller, uh, the opportunities to participate in the economy, the wealth gets consolidated, of course, the wealth is not spread around, we can't invest in ourselves, we, we don't have much of a prospect. Um, but this, of course, reverses. So in North Dakota, you have low unemployment, you have low foreclosures, the lowest in the nation. Uh, you've got a very vibrant community banking institution. 
and now that's an important part, a distinction to make, as I tried before, to make the distinction between community banks, credit unions, and savings and loans, and the Wall Street banks. So not all bankers are creative equal. They're not doing the same things. The Wall Street banks are investing uh, around the world, other places. Community banks, savings and loans, are serving the people. They know their clients, they know the neighborhoods, they know the economies, and they are, they are on the front lines of lending credit into the community. That, that credit being the lifeblood of any economy. So we've seen since 2008 uh, a, a shrinkage of the credit um, from community banks and from actually from the large banks too. The large banks don't want to lend money to our, to our small businesses because it's not as profitable, there's more risk, they can make more money borrowing from the Fed and putting it out into no, no show paper. So that's, that's their game. They really don't care about the setting boards, uh, you know, but the community bankers care and they are getting crushed by the big banks and the regulators and the credit union uh, administration. The, the, uh, the number got crushed in a couple of ways. The regulatory uh, um, steps that were created after 2008 have imposed a tremendous burden on community banks, very expense, expensive for them at a time when the margins for their lending are small and the business is not producing uh, like it used to. So the regulations are really a problem and the margins are small. Uh, and as a result, they're shrinking, they're being bought up by big banks. Uh, and so the community banks then uh, have a troubled sort of a, of a future. When you have a local public bank, as in North Dakota, the community bank uh, institutions really thrive. There are more community banks per capita in North Dakota than anywhere else in the country. Because they have the public bank that partners with them to make loans, stands with them, underwrites their ability to use municipal deposits, uh, and, and uh, works with them to be able to uh, deepen their lending uh, and to stand with them in the event of uh, any crisis and so forth. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful sort of uh, symbiosis, uh, a synergy that makes North Dakota an outlier. Basically, having a public bank isolates you from the global banks and from the Wall Street uh, syndrome. Uh, in North Dakota, and the best example of that is that in North Dakota in 2008, uh, when the rest of the Western global market was, uh, banking market was collapsing and all this that stuff happened, North Dakota had its biggest profitable year ever, the North Dakota Bank. And the, the, the economy there was secured by, uh, by the fact that the economy was sustained, not by Wall Street, wasn't dependent on it. They didn't have their money in Brunei, they had it at home in Bismarck. Uh, and in infrastructure. So uh, as we look at the days ahead in terms of the, um, uh, the, the general global banking horizon, a lot of people see a lot of trouble ahead. Some people predict that we're going to have another collapse and that the collapse is going to be bigger than the last one. And it's going to be also different in terms of how, the, how it's going to play out. In 2008, or yeah, when the collapse happened, we bailed them out. We bailed them out. Uh, you know, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, and actually that's not counting a couple of trillion that they lent to themselves to the Federal Reserve, but it's just a couple of trillion. Um, they, uh, <laughs> uh, we bailed them out. The new rule is it's going to be bail-in. So, all right, we're going to get the taxpayers off the hook. We're not going to uh, take it out of taxpayers' water. We'll take it out of the shareholders' pockets. I mean, it's their bank. They put money in. We, they should be rebalancing their books. Okay, you got bad behavior in the C-suite, but we'll, we'll bail on the shareholders. And we'll also take money, uh, or at least give a haircut to the unsecured, to, to the depositors, which is the largest uh, group of, uh, the unsecured depositors, the largest group of the source of money for banks, people like you and me, and cities, counties, and states, all unsecured depositors. So Portland may have its money in Wells Fargo, or Bank of America or something else. But if one of these behemoths crash because they're inter interlocking all sorts of investing uh, collaborations and overlays, uh, will, that ripple effect, the house of cards starts tumbling down, they got to bail in, they take our money. Okay, literally, that's what we can expect. And that is the law, it is an international agreement, the European Central Bank, the EU, the Bank of England, the Bank of International Settlements, the FDIC, the Fed, everybody will all agree, it's Bail in. It's already happened in Cyprus, in Greece, in Italy. It's, it's the rule. It's the rule. Now, if that happens, and we've already seen that it's happened.
and so it's a, it's not a wild notion. What are we going to do? How are we going to pay the staff and board meetings? You know, with 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 a chick in a bad bank. You know, it's a problem. It's a, it's a serious matter. Prudence, I think, requires that we insist that our that our managers, uh, our financial managers at the municipal and the governmental level, consider this. You know, I mean, it could be big trouble for us. Um, so that's another reason to have a public bank. But uh, uh, let me just say that you know, public banks have a mission. Uh, that's decided by the community. The community says we want to support small business. We might want to support student lending. We might want to in, in, uh, support community banks and lending uh, for homeowners, or maybe help with affordable housing. We might want to stimulate uh, 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 new alternative uh, energy companies, etc. We certainly want to do our own financing for our infrastructure. That's a great way to build a strong bank. And believe me, if you have forty million dollars to capitalize a bank, that'd be an excellent start. So I. Somebody pass that up to City Hall, okay, tell them, I know what we can do with this money, let's start a bank. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I think, a very exciting prospect, but it gives you new options. It gives us an opportunity to move forward with, with a promising sort of a future finance, as opposed to resigning ourselves to being continually in debt, in debt, in debt, and more debt, which will only raise taxes. Now, that part of the, of the cycle in which we're creating profits reduces the pressure on taxes. In North Dakota, that the, the Bank of North Dakota has been has contributed about four hundred million dollars, again, small 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 state, four hundred million dollars in the last ten years to the state treasury. So the depression is pushing down the, the, the need and the reliance on, uh, on having to raise taxes uh, by the fact that it's actually creating new money. So in a sense, I'm saying, look, let's get the money out of the basement, out of the equity that we've got here in our common wealth, buy it, buy it the means of a bank, and then use that bank just the way any other bank does to responsibly invest in ourselves through a variety of, uh, uh, of investments that reflect our values and as opposed to uh, the ones that, uh, the bottom lines that uh, Wall Street wants to drop. All right. Uh, historically, I, I find this kind of interesting. Historically, we, you know, we've talked about how where, where money historically has been in the hands of the elite, we know that. But in the time period, in two particular time periods, uh, 200 years ago, or when, in, 17, in the early 1700s, uh, the colonists, the American colonists, had a public bank. And it was a terrifically successful bank. Uh, in fact, Ben Franklin bragged about it on his trip to England. Uh, you know, it was the Quaker Bank. And the Quakers, uh, uh, decided that instead of having to deal, deal with gold, which nobody had, the gold was controlled by the franchise of the Bank of England and the king, you had to get it from him, you had to you know, pay tribute and, and do your exchange that way. They said, look, you know, we can't wait for that, we need more, we need credit, people need to build stuff. And, uh, and so they created a script called the Continental, and the Continental was then the, 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 the realm, the, the currency of the realm was readily accepted by everybody, and it became the driver for a, a tremendously successful uh, colonial uh, initiative and effort in Philadelphia and elsewhere around the country. And when Ben Franklin went to England and told them about uh, how, you know, how great things were going, they said, well, why? He said, well, because we issue people credit. You know, we, we give them a chance to build lives. Everybody has their own initiative and their, their genius, and we actually enable them to do that. And the king, it's terrible. Money to them? <laughs> no, you can't do that. You will get your money from us and you'll pay us for it. You know? Controlling that franchise is the nature of the Wall Street banks that we are dealing with. But it's also that was also the reason. Because what happened when they did when the English uh, inflated the, the common currency, when they undermined it in that regard. Uh, and when the uh, king made it against the law to issue currency, uh, the Americans started, to, their economy started to nosedive, and it got to be an economic depression. So, and we see this in austerity all around the world now, when there's no money. People can't, the local economies can't survive. And, and Franklin later said, well, you know, this is probably the primary reason that we had a revolution here. 
because we didn't have access to building that and have the independence and the power that people uh, deserve to have. Uh, so uh, that, <laughs> that historical reference is kind of mirrored, I think, uh, now in um, about 100 years ago when the Bank of North Dakota started, uh, when the, uh, the, gold, the gilded age of the oligarchs and the monopolists were running the show uh, and they had control and there was, of course, the populists were underway too, the socialists uh, were, were uh, speaking, William Jennings Bryan, Teddy Roosevelt, all wanting to break up the monopolies because it was, what were they doing? In North Dakota, what they were doing, the, the New York bankers in collusion with the New York railroaders and the Minneapolis of the Minnesota granary uh, magnates were undermining the, the, the level of value for the grain that the North Dakota farmers were toiling over. When they took it to, to the exchange, they were getting lowballed. They didn't have then enough money to pay for their mortgages, so the, local, so the bankers came in, took the farms, took the homes, and undermined the vitality of that, of that uh, uh, economy. And as a result, the people got together and said, hey, we're getting we get taken. Everybody can see this. This is something that we have to, you know, what are we going to do about it? Well, so they decided to create, uh, a hundred years ago this year, a thing called the Nonpartisan League, essentially a political party. But it was for all people that really allowed uh, them to take a stand uh, against that sort of usury, or that sort of, uh, of uh, control, and to take a stand for their own interests. First thing they did when they, they had a landslide victory, they took over the government in North Dakota. They created a state granary, so they were able to prop up the farmers' prices, make that economy work. Then they created the public bank in North Dakota. So if that bank is about 96 years old, again, uh, one of the most, if perhaps the most successful bank in the country, uh, it, just simply using the rights of people to, the sovereign right of people to control their own money. Now it's a sovereign right not to create money, but to use and control instead of handing it over to the financial interests. So um, if, you, if you would look at the, the a diagram of how it works, your taxpayer dollars here goes to the, goes to the city or the, the state. And at the moment now, the state will deposit all that money into a Wall Street bank or a large bank. And then that bank will use your money to invest in various things and it will you know, do all kinds of things that they do, speculation and so forth. And that big bank then will get the proceeds and they will pay your, your city something. Like right now your accounts are getting like 0.06% and, and hundreds of millions of dollars are sitting, you know, your, of, of, of your money, sitting in accounts just like that, waiting to be used. Waiting to be used, wait, waiting for a collapse, waiting for some eventuality, waiting for the, the, the need uh, to, to do the project that you said you wanted to start. Well, it's not yet, in other words, you're not using the money very wisely, but Wall Street is benefiting and it is a, uh, it's, it's a great play for them, but not so good for us. Now, with a public bank, your tax dollars goes to the city and then it goes into the public bank. The public bank then uh, invests locally by making loans to cities, counties, and states, and so forth. And then the proceeds from that come back into the community by creating schools, businesses, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and creates this very nice cycle of, of wealth, of building wealth. It's just, it's kind of like, it's so logical. You know, it's like, well, how come this, we don't have this already? Uh, a lot of people say that. It's like, wow, where's this been? Well, you know, this is not something Wall Street likes to talk about very much. So, uh, so uh, the public bank can create a huge amount of credit and capital without the need to feed uh, fat CEOs bonuses uh, and or other management fund, uh, fund management uh, uh, profiteers. So, um, you, you know, I think we see this pushback with Bernie Sanders and with Mr. Trump, this populist uh, uprising against the sort of abuse that we're all experiencing in the, lap, the loss of homes and jobs. Uh, the, the loss of prospect for students, uh, the, the, you know, the lifelong debt that's, that's uh, 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 been developed. Um, in order to talk about students, uh, anybody here have student loans? Yeah? yeah? Um, and I don't know why you had it, but what kind of an interest rate do you think? Seven. Oh, it's All right. You should move to North Dakota. Let's say North Dakota. <laughs> North Dakota, uh, as one of its lines of business, quote unquote business, is 
about a third of its portfolio, they invest or they offer student loans. They refinance your student debt. You, you could get a loan in North Dakota for 1.75% interest on an adjustable basis, 1% mark over a year, but not per year, but adjustable rate prospect, but basically it's pretty flat. Of course, the interest rates have been flat for a long time. Um, now, that kind of investment into a community means a lot of things. First of all, it means a great deal to the people who are living here, the students who want to build lives, want to, we want them to participate in the local economy, to be able to go out to dinner, to be able to invest in things. Well, that's that kind of mission-driven lending, defined by the stakeholders, each one of us, uh, helps to guide the, the, the investment mission of the public bank. Now, I should make another distinction, and, and that is that this bank is not run by politicians or elected officials. This is not a function of city government. It is a separate entity, at least the North Dakota model is. And that's really important, because we all know sometimes there could be some undue influence, some preferences exercised, some connections made. Um, this bank is, is, uh, has been very successful in not having that influence for a couple of reasons. Uh, it, it is designed with two arm's length sort of difference, uh, distance from the political influence. The elected officials are the ones, the city council, we don't have a bank, but great, we've got a bank, we'll have the, the mayor, uh, the, maybe the, the city attorney, the city treasurer, will be the ones, we'll, we'll give them the responsibility of naming the board of directors. So there's the elected officials, the board of directors, and then the management of the bank. That's my two arm lengths description. Uh, the board of directors is, would be approved, uh, depending on how you decide, but that would be made up of some of the stakeholders, all of them meaning the community interests, meaning the financial interests, the corporate interests, the, uh, the business people uh, who, uh, who have a say in the community and would help to guide the lending and the focus of the, of the loan products. And then they hire the bankers. The bankers, and I do mean bankers, that are, are civil employees, they're getting reasonable salaries. The, they're not, they're not, it's not Jamie Dimon getting $27 million a year. There, there are no bonuses. There's no incentive for them to do any of that. They're not allowed. Their job is to simply make sure that, to, that the risks that they take on behalf of the people are reasonable and consistent with the mission of the bank. Boring banking, we call it. But boring banking is very profitable. And, it does, and the risks can be dramatically reduced, especially when you're lending to yourself. You know? So uh, uh, that is, a, again, another, uh, a, another advantage. Uh, and you know, one of the differences that, that shows up maybe in, in history, another indicator is the, uh, in North Dakota, there was a huge flood in 1997 along the Grand Forks River, wiped out two towns, one on either side of the river, one in North Dakota, one in Minneapolis or Minnesota. Uh, it was Grand Forks, North Dakota, Grand Forks, Minnesota. Um, the next day, the public bank in North Dakota was on the scene with money to be able to start cleaning up, to secure people's mortgages, to make sure that they didn't, that they, you know, don't worry about your mortgage, don't worry about that stuff, let's just get you guys straightened up here, we'll take care of it later on. And that's not the first time they did that, by the way. They did that back in the 30s, when the bankers were foreclosing on farms, and they said, well, we can't, we can't do this to these people. Because, you know, it's the, it's a, we're family, right? And we have uh, mutual interests. We belong to each other. And I think that's kind of, this is the kind of a financial interest that allows that to, uh, to be expressed. So uh, the net result of the Grand Forks flood was that um, uh, in North Dakota, they ultimately lost 3% of their population because of, what, of how much it devastated the area. Across the river, uh, in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, uh, they lost 17%. So fully, almost one-fifth of that community was disabled and disappeared from the wealth and from its, from its underpinnings, uh, uh, from its uh, financial stability, economic stability. Um, all because they had access to capital. So if you had a, you know, how, where would you get the money to do these repairs? If FEMA didn't have it, you'd have to go to the bond market, you'd have to go to Wall Street. You want to take a, you want to take a, a risk on a, on a muddy city, you know, where, where things are up in? So uh, that, makes it even more problematic. All right, well, I've been talking a long time now. I'm going to try to bring it up to a head here so you can have some, uh, ask me some questions. Um, but I think right now, this historical moment is something we should reflect on. When you look at what's going on around the world, and we, we see how the economy is affected all over the world, and driven primarily by the global banking interests, that in 
insist on getting their money, not just money that they made up, basically. You know, they, they just created it and they lent it, and they, but they want their full interest payments. And if you can't do that, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to start selling off stuff uh, so that you can pay us in full. The debt forgiveness is not on their list, uh, and not anymore. It didn't used to be, but uh, the bank, the big banks are really fulfilling their business model or, or a capability of actually blowing up markets, uh, inflating markets, and then collapsing them so that the assets are grabbed up, your farms, your homes, and so forth, your jobs. In the case of Greece, your ports, your beaches, your, you know, your public, uh, your, your commonwealth, all of that, that get into the maw of, 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 the, of the banking cartel, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, that gets reflected in, in our government. Now, you know, we know money in politics is a bad idea. It's, it, it, it's so present. We really need to do something about that. Uh, I wish us all luck at being able to succeed. But, and, and, and I think we can, because I think that, you know, even though they've got the money, we have the people. If we would stand together and, in a unified and a practical and a strategic way, we will get things done. That's the hope of democracy. And the only place that I think that we have a, an opportunity uh, for, for this to work is locally. So there is this, uh, a new campaign that the Public Banking Institute is launching this year. It's called What Wall Street Costs America. What Wall Street Costs America as a way of doing a couple of things. As a way of, first of all, bringing to light this enormous, the hundreds of billions of dollars that are extracted from our communities every year in, in uh, pay for borrowing this money. And what it has cost us, both in terms of actually quantifying it, uh, and then also to be able to tell the stories about how it has affected people. And how, how does this really, uh, what does this look like on Main Street? It looks like people living on Main Street, uh, losing their jobs and homes, we own millions of homes and so forth. We know what it's like. Um, and, and by bringing that to light as creating a new national discussion about it where people say, hey, do you know that we spend $48 million a year on interest in this town? You know, what else could we do with that? Just to raise that question, for people to become aware of it, to go to City Hall, to go to their, uh, their councilman, uh, to ask the treasurer, say, you know, we don't have to do this, you know. <laughs> we could actually reverse the situation and be pretty fat and happy if we would just kind of be creative a little bit more progressive about what we're, first pay attention. Well, that's what is what Wall Street Costs America is intends to open. But it's also doing something else. It, you know, when I talk about creating citizen action, it's also meant to do something that not uh, that those of us who are progressively minded and want to see some changes, uh, that we don't do very well. And that's cross over through our respective interests and collaborate on a common strategy, on a way to, to, to make a more powerful front line of support for the politicians and for our elected officials who are willing to make a change if they don't have to stick their necks out, if they know the people are there. So it opens that kind of discussion of let's, you know, let's make some big changes here. Let's do what's logical. And, uh, and what Wall Street Cross America then is the place that all of us can participate. And, uh, and I mean by participation, that also means you can tell your story. You know, you can report uh, and we'll put it on the, we're going to create a website that will have a map and it'll have these stories and have this data position so you can map over uh, your area. Hopefully, if we have the data uh, that, that will be uh, available to you and with that data then, some narratives. I'll give you one, one narrative example. The city of Ferguson, Missouri, in the news for horrible reasons, uh, was, was financially stressed uh, by its uh, by bond obligations to Wall Street that it couldn't maintain, couldn't maintain in part because the economy was undermined by the uh, by the by the economy of the area, uh, and so what they used instead was the police force and citations to to cite about seventy five percent of the citizens there had citations of one form or another, so they extracted the money from the people, the poor people and created the cycle of increasing debt, throwing people in jail and all of that stuff. And of course, resulting in people running away from cops and then of course, resulting in some of them getting killed. Well, that's uh, a really, uh, that is one of the costs. 
What are the direct costs? Um, well, should, maybe it's an indirect cost. Well, I have to consider it a direct cost. We know that if people are not allowed to have safe, secure lives because they can't afford it, then you know that is that is a relationship that we need to intervene in. So um, I'm going to stop there and uh, open up the floor to your questions uh, and invite you to participate in that and to uh, invite you also to do a little bit of research and see what this, how you could affect the conversation with your elected officials so that they can embrace this.